Seeing Scott Van Pelt made me think of something, Stugat, that I miss very much. ESPN? Ar around sports. Oh. <laughs> um, one of the things that is gone from the way we, many of us, are now watching television is commercials. And ESPN television did some of the greatest commercials that there were anywhere at any time in sports. But I thought of it when I thought, uh, when I saw Wemby's logo release the other day and just thought about how it is that athletes are marketed today. And in the streaming age, the relevance, the importance, and the quality of commercials has died where you do not have athletes being supported. I don't think. Now, you can help. Please correct me if I'm wrong because keep in mind, I'm speaking from a place of ignorance. At this point, I see very few commercials when watching. Watching television, So maybe there's some sort of campaign out there that I don't know about that sets up the next Michael Jordan the way Nike originally set him up with Spike Lee commercials that were so artfully done that it didn't even matter that Michael Jordan as an entity wasn't terribly quotable or magnetic as a personality. They just framed him in a mythology in the commercial making that made it seem... Like he was a transcendent god with the best marketing package that anybody could buy. They were right. Nike has now made this for Wembenyama as a logo. And yesterday was controversial. They released it during the eclipse. And the extraterrestrial sort of spider feel of it, I thought, was unbelievably cool. I thought when this guy is running this sport as he's going to be if he stays healthy. This, as a crop circle type of extraterrestrial, this is from another land, uh, another galaxy logo, I thought was exceptional. Did you guys have any reaction whatsoever to the debut of the Wembenyama Nike logo? Because the marketing around this guy, Nike's got a real chance to show people again why it is that they've dominated the marketing space with not just their sneakers but the way it is that they sell athletes so i saw it for the first time obviously yesterday as well and i thought to myself the same thing that you thought wow that's really really cool but also i don't think you and i are the people who determine what's cool so i have no idea like, what I think is cool, I have no idea if younger people think it's cool. Well, answer my question about commercials. Is there a campaign right now that's selling any kind of athlete in a way that's making them greater than, in terms of personality, than their natural personality? Because there, I don't think in the history, uh, was it, Wide, is it Weidman Kennedy? Those ESPN Sports Center ads are among the best in the history of commercial television. But I think, Nike, we can all agree that in the history of marketing, there have not been a lot of American entities ever better at marketing than Nike. I agree they're great at marketing, but you are not allowed to say that this is cool if you did not think the eclipse was cool. Like, yeah. you just can't. Nope, you're not allowed. Why? I can't? Correct. No, not Why? allowed. Because this right. was cool because it was marketed and tied in with the eclipse. Ah! I feel like I'm going crazy that no one here thinks the eclipse is cool. I do. Except Greg! <laughs> Greg, let's go watch some Columbo later. Yeah, please. I find this I find this all very dumb. It's like giving an endorsement contract to a Texas sized asteroid that's coming to destroy your planet. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I would like the logo more if uh, wait, 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 wait. what are you agreeing with? What do you, you just let, agree let me, with? I, let me just let me just make sure that you no, weren't. Greg's you, right, did Greg's you listen? Right. Was that a bridge to your I know point he's always right, Billy. I, I know that I, Billy, I know I'm familiar with your work on Tuesdays. Thank you, Billy. I know that Greg's right. He's always right. But I don't think he actually absorbed anything Mike said. I think he was just waiting for him to stop talking so he could then talk. Okay. What are you agreeing with? Mike Correct me if I'm wrong. You made a remark just now that I interpreted as being against that logo. No, you what, don't like what, that no, logo. What no, 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 it, no. I, I'm against uh, Victor Wembanyama and everything that he stands for because I think you should be outlawed from the game. He's going to destroy the game that we. You hold weren't listening at all to good. him, right? Okay. You, you weren't, agree. You weren't yeah. listening. No, I, thought, I misunderstood. This is like giving AI a Burger King commercial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, AI. Don't get me started on that. Huh. If if Wembanyama's nickname were Space Alien, I would love the logo, but since it's not. The only redeeming value in that logo is that it vaguely has the pattern of a basketball. 
the lines of a basketball. Otherwise, you wouldn't even know what sport. Do you know how vaguely. frustrating? Do you know how frustrating it is to me? It's generally like speaking. presenting climate change by Hoka. That Mike Ryan is making a point. Are you still belaboring that? Well, I'm going to tell you why. I'm just going to okay. tell you why. What happened here and what my what my Tuesdays are like. <laughs> don't know how to move on. Got to want to learn. Got to want to earn. That's right. That kind of thing. Exactly. Good. Well said, Jeff. You know got to write that down. Note to self: Look into personal logo. Yeah. Okay. It's like micro. I'll do it. I'll do it better than that. I promise you. It's like giving micro plastics a Merrill Lynch endorsement deal. Well said. I think they already have that. I agree. Mike Ryan made a point. Oh, still on it. Okay. <laughs> that you didn't listen to it all, didn't absorb, don't know what he said. Right. You said, I agree. That's not the most frustrating part of it. And then that corner right there says, and I agree with Greg Cody when well, Billy, he said he's right. Billy right. doesn't know what he was agreeing with, and Thank Greg you, Cody doesn't know what he's agreeing with. So all of the noise that comes after Mike Ryan making the point he's making is people who are agreeing with something they didn't understand. <laughs> we stand united behind Mike. Mm -hmm. Good teammates. Yes, and... Don't look at me. I've done it a million times. <laughs> you think you can do a better logo than that? Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. I'd like. Oh, let, uh, no, uh, no. Uh, let's see. He's let, not a graphic uh, artist. And Wemby didn't no, come up with that himself. I know, but he just said he could produce yeah, a better. He just guaranteed us. He made it a guarantee. I guarantee you, I can produce a better logo than that. That's what he just said. Can we give the man a week? I yeah, mean, yeah, Wemby had seriously. a team. He exactly. had some time to think about okay. it. So do you have a back think? in my day today? Is it Tuesday? Yes. Of course I do. There you go. Oh, hey. You do? Yeah. Wow. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Yeah. Duh. And you're in. Yep. Of course I do. Jeez. Should go without saying. <laughs> no, at this time next week, I will reveal <laughs> a Greg Cody personal logo. Nice. That hopefully Nike will pick up. And we'll be better than that one, you, you guarantee. Oh, yeah. oh God, yes. Mm -hmm. It's a crusty That's a ridiculous Sperry. logo. Give him time. It doesn't say, it doesn't say Wembanyama. It doesn't. Yeah, it should have a Wemby, you know, something like that. Anything. Oh, God, we're going to it right now. And now <laughs> it is time to take a trip down memory lane. Here's your guy, Greg Cody, with Back in My Day. Wow, a prop. <laughs> <laughs> he really did come prepared. Wow. He's got an old fashioned How dare you question press him. hat on. <laughs> Sports attire. One thing we don't do nearly enough is learn from the past and emulate it. In my line of work, sports writing, the old scribes would wear suits, including press hats like this one, in press boxes during games. That's even before my time. I'm talking early 20th century. The late great Edwin Pope might have seen it. Those were days when newspapers were chucked onto lawns by kids on bikes, when a sports writer took notes longhand with a pencil and was free to get the quote wrong because tape recorders hadn't been invented. Stories clacked to life on heavy battleship gray typewriters. Clunky cameras had flash bulbs that popped and press boxes were filled with acrid cigar smoke. Ah, what we have given up in the misbegotten name of progress. This was an era in sports writing when Philadelphia <laughs> Athletics manager Connie Mack wore a full suit in the dugout, <laughs> sometimes with an overcoat as well, and topped with a hat. He'd switch it up. Oft times a wide band fedora topped the tall technician's skull. Other times a black bowler derby did, and sometimes rakishly it was a straw English boater. Mack was way ahead of his time. Contemporaries of his like John McGraw and Joe McCarthy and other managers wore uniforms like they do today, but Mac sat bolt upright on the dugout bench necktie peeking out from <laughs> under a vest. He was ahead of his time because he inherently understood that, except for the rare player manager which expired in the 1960s, there was zero need for a manager to be in uniform unless the express purpose was to look silly. Baseball managers remain the only coaches in American professional sports to still wear uniforms for reasons eternally elusive. What a shock it never caught on, huh? Trying to picture Greg Popovich courtside in the tank top shorts and sneaks. How about a hockey coach fully padded up and on skates on the bench or Andy Reid in a football helmet? A baseball manager dressed ready for action makes as much sense as a fan showing up at the ballpark in full uniform. 
Old Bobby Cox, looking like the world's oldest player, went so far as to wear spikes and a cup during games, even as it took him a week to ascend the dugout steps and another month to waddle to the mound. Let's bring back common sense in sports attire and a sense of decorum and class as well. I want to meet the next newly hired big league manager who has the baseballs to wear a suit in the dugout, to throw it back with a tip of the cap, a tip of the fedora to Connie Mack. I'm going to do my part by, from now on, making a press hat de rigueur in my working ensemble at games. I'm Greg Cody, and that's how it was, even back before my day. Connie Mack was born in 1862. (laughs) Damn right he was. Friends, colleagues, mentors. Countrymen. Countrymen. I'm addressing everyone in here. I was just trying to see how far I could go with that. It is time to update March Sadness. We have our final four, guys. Who's excited? Greg? Yeah, I am. Do you think you have a clue from the Greg Cody region what made the final four? Um, I don't know. I hope Lovely Cruz made it because that's dear to my heart. I don't even think that made the Sweet 16. Did not. (laughs) <laughs> and as I remind you, March Sadness is presented. Your, your limited fake oh, Romo, your March limited Sadness. fake Tony Romo is very good, Jessica. As I remind you, March Sadness is presented by Get Your Guide. Discover over 100,000 unforgettable travel experiences in the U.S. and around the world at getyourguide.com. Wow. All right. The really, song region. Really hammer the dot com there. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to hammer everything. Great so you read. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The song region. I mean, we know who made this, right? The one seed. It's it's the favorite in the whole tournament. The one seed from the song region, Puka Nakua. His name is Cooper. Good at running curls. But when his hammy got a tear, he saw Puka standing there. And we wonder now, who will that go up against? Well, the song region is going up against the region of death. And who made it? Wow. A 16 seed no made it to the final four, and it's Roy as the bear. <laughs> it's excellent. I've got to be honest. Uh, Roy Bellamy, the, the costume that he ended up putting together, very sparse. It's a cigarette, it's a backward cap, and it's an apron, and yet he pulls off looking like somebody who would be working in the kitchen of the bear. Hmm. So it's very exciting to see who will make the final from those two. In the other matchup, we have out of the Greg Cody region. Wow. Let's see. This it's nice hat. Can't trade Marino. <laughs> nice hat. Trade nice hat. Zazzle. It's what he's most known for. It's like I'm holding on to it. Do you remember what Scott Mitchell looked like in that next game after Marino? They got were hurt? nine and two. They were oh, nine and two. Amazing. <laughs> and then they lost their last five and missed the playoffs. Nice they hat. They were nine and two. But it's, it's Marino. Nice and then hat. the next time we saw Marino after Greg Cody yeah, traded him. He threw for five touchdowns, nice and he was hat. Dan the Man on the I cover of Sports Illustrated. You can't trade Marino. Nice head. <laughs> <laughs> so that makes our, our final four. Deserving. I mean, And it is going against the club region. Who do you guys think made it here? We had we had I Get Bitches left Lucy. and right. And it's got to be Lucy. You fat piece of bleep. Hmm. <laughs> so just lowest common denominator. That's right. <laughs> yep. And I'm the winner. I'm guessing Lucy is going to be the winner. And the winner. Reaching the final four, eight seed. I was getting bitches left and right. <laughs> <laughs> I, we need Lucy to win as a consolation prize for Caitlin Clark and Iowa losing. Well, she's going to come in second place. You could just rename all of March Sadness Lucy Rodine. This feels like Puka Nakua versus Nice Hat to me. Greg, they, yeah, had a 50% all Greg chance. Final. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> her sadness is profound, right? Lucy, yes. we have not been able to check in with her this week. Is she broken? Is she taking leave just because she's so sad? Yeah, I I think so. No, I, I do think she'll she'll be back tomorrow. But um, I mean, devastating two years yeah. for Lucy losing in the championship back to back. It's very really Buffalo tough. Bills of uh, the Iowa Hawkeyes. Really. Except they did it four times. I know. Imagine if imagine if Lucy had to go through this two more times. Oh my God. Stugatz is getting mad at many of the people who have commentary about Caitlin Clark that's less than positive about her professional chances. The the UConn women who are doing analysis, and this is part of what it is that you get. Caleb Williams is getting it. Everyone who's going to come into a league with expectations is going to have his or her critics. Really what I'm upset about is just criticizing Caitlin in general for what she's done for the game and pointing out, hey, I have more rings. Leave that to me. Leave that to the media. 
Do you want your game to grow or do you not? No, I did not go to my television set when Brianna Stewart was winning four championships with UConn. But somehow, Caitlin Clark got me there for an Elite Eight game. She got me there. I am. But she got me there for an Elite Eight game. She got me and my family there for a semifinal game. And she got me and my wife sitting around 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon watching a women's college basketball game. She should be applauded for that. And I don't understand. She's been, she's been plenty applauded for that. Dawn Staley had to go out of her way because she knows some of the blowback that Clayton, uh, Caitlin Clark is getting from other players. And so she had to go out of her way while she's hoisting the trophy to say thank you to Caitlin Clark for being one of the GOATs. I just don't get it. Do you want your sport to grow or not? And who cares how it grows or who's the reason that it grows? It grew because of Caitlin Clark. It's going to continue to grow because of what Caitlin Clark did this year. Did you listen to Diana Tarazi's full comments? Let's no. uh, Let's play them okay. here for Stugat. Right when the college guys come out, they're waiting for them. I mean, Camilla's coming, Caitlin's coming. There's more than just that that are coming. What will the league have in store for them when they get there? Look, SVP, um, <laughs> reality is coming. Okay. <laughs> you know, there's there's levels to this thing, and that's just life. We all went through it. Of course. Um, and you see it on the NBA side, and you're going to see it on this side, where, you know, they, you look superhuman playing against 18-year-olds, but you're going to come with some grown women that have been playing professional basketball for a long time. Not saying that it's not going to translate, because when you're great at what you do, you're just going to get better. But there is going to be a transition period where you're going to have to give yourself some grace as a rookie. And, uh, you know, it might take a little bit longer for some people. Right on. That's Projecting what she'll be once she gets to the WNBA is different than criticizing her for what she did in college. So I'm getting, I'm not upset at people who are saying, hey, but she who might. Did that? How many people were doing that? How oh, Brianna, I mean, there were a bunch of people saying, well, why Brianna is she Stewart getting. Brianna Stewart said you have to win a ring to be the GOAT or something. And Brianna Stewart has four championships. But, so, yeah, I mean, you, isn't that your whole take? Well, that's my take, and I'm saying leave that take to me. Brianna Stewart, you don't need to go there, okay? <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say. I mean, that you're entitled to say it, but you it should come from me. It should not come so. from Brianna Stewart. Her game grew. Does she care about the game? Okay. What a or pivot is from Stu Is she upset about the fact that she's not the one that grew it the way Caitlin Clark did? Uh, perhaps that could be part of what is tinged here is that Caitlin Clark is getting something that no one in the history of the sport has gotten and other players in the sport might consider themselves worthy of that uh, distinction. I just think it's fairly amazing that you feel like you're entitled to the take, but four-time champion Brianna Stewart should stay out of this discussion. Uh, I think there's a, an element of like... Players don't want to be told that what they did right. didn't matter because people weren't paying attention. And I think that Caitlin Clark's rise, we need to put it in context of what is happening right now across all of college sports, which, which is now players are allowed to make endorsement deals and players are allowed to monetize themselves. And I think her style of play is a huge reason why she's hugely popular and she shoots three pointers from the logo and they go in and she has the all-time scoring record like she's an incredibly exciting player to watch the way that she plays people are mesmerized by but I think there's also an element of like we don't have to like tiptoe around the fact that she is a money maker now she can actually make that money and it catapults her into a level of stardom that previously players were not able to do because of the dumb NCAA and its dumb rules I do understand though why any of the people who had less press attention but comparable skills would be in whatever ways they're contaminated their viewpoint is contaminated by whatever their allegiances are. It can be as simple as you went to UConn and uh, your coverage is going to be UConn biased and intensive. Uh, I can understand any previous pioneer, a Diana Taurasi, looking at how hard they had it, and maybe not all of them would show great grace in those circumstances, seeing that Caitlin Clark has dominated getting the fruits of everybody's labor, right? Because this is the culmination. This moment is the culmination of a lot of work that predates Caitlin Clark before uh, all of this attention got here and some other people might feel like they're entitled to it. And like Caitlin hasn't even like said all like she's she's not done anything wrong. Like she has been very gracious about all of it and like recognizing the past legends and stuff. I think 
what's very exciting about all of this is that you can tune in and see how Caitlin Clark does in the WNBA Ooh. in like a month because the draft is next week. And guess what? Diana Taurasi's team, the Phoenix Mercury, they're already marketing their game against the Fever as the rookie versus the GOAT. So this is all great marketing for the W. <laughs> Diana Taurasi knows what she's doing, and she doesn't care if you call her a hater because that is her whole vibe. And if you're just finding out who she is, go look up some highlights. She's a... Uh, yeah, she's fun to watch. Too. I hope Clark puts fifty up on her. <laughs> That's sports. I, uh, Cheryl Miller. I'm I'm ready. I am ready to proclaim once and for all that, and I'm thankful that the NFL was able to eradicate uh, racism once and for all last season. I am ready to say that we've finally reached equality because who's the goat? is now a conversation in women's sports. <laughs> the, the, the thing that makes my face numb and makes me just tired of the discussion because I'm still seeing it on sports networks, is it LeBron or is it Michael Jordan? We know it's Jordan now, uh, right? Yeah. So that's over. So well, now it's not said and done. And also, I, people were <laughs> DMing me yesterday. They're like, you said you go talk, blah, blah, blah. Don Staley brought up the goat yep. talk, all right? She said Caitlin Clark was one of the goats, and we were debating if you can be one of the goats, so blame Don, not me. Yeah. She started goat talk this week with Caitlin Clark. <laughs> it is one of the foolproof ways to always discuss sports in a way that's not going to interest me. <laughs> I do find it interesting that the, a hot take. I, I was watching it in a sports bar where a lot of dudes were super into the game, and the Phillies were playing at the same time, and they asked for the Iowa game to have the sound on, and I heard a lot of takes in there that you know were your basic level hot takes, which is why is she going to go to the WNBA because she she matters so much right now uh, in college, and I understand that there's a brand awareness that comes with college that maybe Joe sports fan who hasn't really been paying attention to the W uh, doesn't necessarily need to overcome for college, but she's a bona fide needle mover. How, how, why would you doubt her at this point when she, Caitlin Clark has done more for women's college basketball in terms of bringing people into the tent than anyone else? Why would you doubt her, especially a lot of these Joe sports fans that are just coming around to the phenomenon and pushing it to these new heights by being casual observers of it? You don't think that's going to be there with the hype train when the GOAT takes on the rookie? I imagine that's going to be a really difficult ticket to get. And by the way, where do you go? When there's a really difficult to get, when the primary <laughs> market huh. is all dried up, Tell you us. turn to the secondary market. Huh. Well, wow. who's the best in the secondary market? Uh, it may just be my opinion, but I think it's game time. Do yourself a favor. <laughs> download the game time app. Create an account and use the code Dan for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. In this case, you could see the goat or the rookie. And you could see exactly your seat and what the view might be of the goat and the rookie. All the fees up front, low price guarantee. If you, for whatever reason, find another price out there that may be lower, you alert game time to it, and they got your back, Jack. There you go. Uh, that's brilliant marketing, the goat versus the rook. And you're going to see it throughout the WNBA, I hope. Caitlin Clark's going to continue to be a moneymaker, a great businesswoman for the uh, WNBA and bring nothing but positive marketing. However, it is perfectly fair to wonder and maybe even be a little, just a tiny bit skeptical, how are her talents going to translate in the NBA where she's going against players who are four or five years older, who are veteran professionals, who are more athletic than what she's been used to facing. You know, I, 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 I read a, a criticism. South Carolina was pretty athletic. No, you're I mean. right. But, but again, it, it, it's on a lower level. And, and I did read a criticism that Caitlin Clark has a high dribble which in the pros may be susceptible to, to athletic defenders stealing her. So, you know, there, it, it's going to be fascinating to watch. I'm a fanboy. I, I love Caitlin Clark. I'm going to be fascinated to see how she translates to the WNBA, and I hope she kills it. But it's fair to, to wonder and question until she does. I agree with Greg on everything, and I also think that building rivalries is a huge part of mm -hmm. sports and why I think that – this is all great, and this is part of what is going to drive eyeballs because now you're going to have the Caitlin Clark doubters versus the Caitlin Clark will be rookie of the year this season or, and an all-star and all these things. And I think what's great about the way the season is laid out is that there's uh, – not great for Caitlin Clark, admittedly, because she's not going to get an offseason, is that this all builds towards a draft, which happens next week, and then a few weeks later the season starts and we get to actually just watch her play again. So I – 
I love that this is happening. I think this is awesome. I think um, just in general, like this is what the sport needs. It needs people to pay attention to the different storylines and the different rivalries and to wonder, you know, how will her game translate in a defensive league where people are going to like in the game on Sunday, Raven Johnson shut her down in the last three quarters. She only scored 12 points after she had that huge 18 point first quarter and picked her pocket right before the half was able to dribble away and, and hit a layup to put the Gamecocks up by three going into the half and kind of swing the tides for the rest of the game. Greg, doesn't it stand to reason she's going to be better in the pros? She's playing with I, – I realize she's playing against better opponents, but she's playing with better teammates. The game's more wide open. She's a great shooter, and she's an even better passer. Right. Like, to me, that was the most impressive thing about her, about Caitlin Clark, is her vision, her ability to make passes that I've never seen made before. Like, she was great. Well, you haven't been watching. Well, that's like, fair. I mean, yeah, like yeah. – <laughs> I mean, that's you, totally you've never fair. seen them made before because great you haven't, you though, haven't been this watching. Is, right. This is this is a great moment for women. I know I know many women don't see it right there, but Stu Gatz and Greg Cody pulling analysis out of their ass—that's equality, folks. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Look, Caitlin Clark is a one-woman economy. He's like, you want more? I'll give you more. She's a one-woman yeah, economy, the game. and she's going to bring all that to the pros now. And the WA WNBA needs that. I hope that the momentum from women's basketball, which now sees the women's final out uh, rating the, the men's final, I hope that carries over to the WNBA, and I think it could largely because of Caitlin Clark, and I hope it does. When we're looking at a number of 18.9 million, Jeremy, can you put that into some sort of context for me so that I explain to people over the week you kept breaking uh, record ratings uh, from game to game. The idea that we are now talking about caring enough to argue about the same talking points that we argue about everywhere else is an achievement for this sport that isn't on the magnitude of 18.9 million but the way that people care caring enough to argue about this stuff caring enough to get here and all of a sudden have all sorts of opinions about everything because the roots of what's happening is you care. This is a moment in women's sports over the course of the last week that I have not seen since the U.S. Uh, soccer team did what Brandy Chastain did in order to bring this movement along to the place where you've got a country watching something as appointment television when that television is more fractured than it's ever been. And I'm guessing that on Sundays at 3 o'clock during the NFL season, there's many an NFL game that's not getting $18.9 million. I don't think I'm wrong about that. The big games on Sunday, the 4 p.m. games when the Chiefs are playing or the Cowboys are playing, those are bigger numbers than $18.9 million. But I don't know, Jeremy. You tell me where all the numbers are in sports that would suggest at 3 o'clock on a Sunday, Stu. It's like 3 o'clock on a Sunday that's not the religion, the new religion in this country that is football on Sundays. No, you've got to go find a television in what is your weekend and 3 p.m. Sunday is not any kind of prime time. So the it's not just 18.9 million. It's 18.9 million at a crazy time for people to be at their televisions. The way that the sport is growing, it's up 285% from two years ago, up 89% in viewership from last year. So that's the growth from year over year. It peaked at 24 million viewers. It's the most watched basketball game, men or women's college or pro since 2019. And excluding football and the Olympics, it's the most watched sporting event since 2019. I'm still not watching those stupid ladies. They should be in the kitchen. <laughs> I can't even dunk except for the ones that have dunked, but I'm ignoring those ones. <laughs> Small brains. Do I have funny? <laughs> Do I have it right that the average one o'clock football game? On a Sunday, the average NFL game on a Sunday might not be doing 18.9 million if it's not one of the big, uh, big matchup games. Average game was 17.9 million last year. <laughs> Bigger than the average wow. football game, Stu Gatz. <laughs> 